John chapter number 12. We're going to begin reading in verse number 44. And the Bible says, Jesus cried and said, He that believeth on me, believeth not on me, but on him that sent me. And he that seeth me, seeth him that sent me. I am come a light into the world, that whosoever believeth on me should not abide in darkness. And if any man hear my words and believe not, I judge him not. For I came not to judge the world, but to save the world. He that rejected me and receiveth not my words hath one that judgeth him. The word that I have spoken the same shall judge him in the last day. Now, Lot in this chapter, in fact, one, one of my favorite verses in the New Testament, you know, which is a reference to the Old Testament, but James just prayed it not too long ago. Right? If he be lifted up, he'll draw all men unto him. Right? Just like the brazen serpent in the wilderness with Moses, those that were bitten, if they looked to the serpent, then they lived. If they didn't, they died. Same as Christ. But then, also, we find, sirs, we would see Jesus. Some Gentiles came to him and said, sirs, we would see Jesus. And then Philip went and told Andrew, and then they came to Jesus. And Anyway, a lot in here. And we've got in verse number 38 talking about how he fulfilled all the prophecies and all of the law, we find Isaiah and some of the prophecies that he had about the Lord. And then John explaining, you know, he did this so that what Isaiah said came true. Okay, I mean, there's two different references. The things that Isaiah prophesied. But if we thought on all that, you know, we'd be here until next week. So we start in verse number 44. It says, Jesus cried and said, He that believeth on me, believe not on me, but on him that sent me. Here in a little bit, I'm going to read off a list of announcements. I didn't come up with those. Right? Those were given to me by the pastor. So if you believe the announcements, you don't believe what I said. You believe what the one that gave it to me said. Right? The same is true when it comes to Christ. He said, you don't really believe on me. You believe on him that sent me. Well, I mean, we also know that the triune God, that the Son and the Father are one. So to believe on Christ is to believe on God. But when Christ came, he took on the form of a servant. They thought it not robbery, the Bible said, to take on the form of a servant. Right? So that through serving the will of the Father, many would come to the saving knowledge of Christ. So he says, I never testified of myself. What he's saying is, I never told you to believe on a man, right? To believe in the works that someone did. I told you to believe on the Father. He said, I'm the Son of the Father. Everything that I have said, I have said about the Father to bring glory and honor unto our Father. We talked on that a few weeks ago. He's saying, everything that I've done was according to His will. So to believe on me is to believe that I did everything that the Father told me to do. Leaving nothing out, adding nothing to it. He says, truly to believe on the servant is to believe on the one that sent him. That same is true today. Doesn't matter who's preaching, right? As long as it's the gospel of God, as long as it's what thus saith the Lord... They're not believing in the man. They're believing on the words that he was given from the book. They're believing on the master. They're believing on the Lord. Right? Some people haven't figured that out. Right? If somebody's not there to do the preaching, or if somebody is there to do the preaching, side of, you know, the crowd and the size of the crowd will fluctuate. It right? tells me that they're not looking for the master. They're looking for the servant that was being sent. And in fact, we find that in this chapter. You know, this is the chapter where, you know, the people of Jerusalem, they hear that he's coming from Bethany. Many went out to see him at Bethany because they had heard that Lazarus was dead, but now he was sitting there and eating dinner with Jesus. Right? Many came to see that. Many came to see Jesus. But they didn't come out to believe on him. They came out to see what all the commotion was about. Many believed on him, but many also did not. Right? Just because you hear doesn't mean that you're really here. Just because you believe, the devils believe and they fear and tremble. 
belief is not enough but what he's saying in verse number 44 he says doesn't say believe in believe on right we have this recorded testament and we've got four different chapters in the gospels on all that Christ did and then we've got commentary on it from the apostle Paul who adds context to it right but the gospel itself we've got four accounts that say Jesus was who he said he was well, who did he claim to be when he came? he came? He claimed to be the lamb that was slain before the foundation of the world. In this chapter, Palm Sunday as it's often referred to, he rides in on a borrowed colt. They're throwing down palm leaves, shouting, Hosanna, Hosanna. They're expecting him to kick Rome out and to sit on the throne of David that day. He didn't say that he came to judge or came to to bring damnation. We already read it down in verse number uh, 46. Or I'm sorry, verse number 47. If any man hear my word and believe not, I judge him not, for I came not to judge the world, but to save the world. Same as John 3, 17. Right? Jesus did not come this time as conqueror. He came as Christ. He came as the reconciler of that which was lost came seeking to save that which was lost but these people weren't looking for Christ they wanted to see the millennial reign start now they wanted to see all of their problems taken care of they thought that Rome was their problem Jesus was trying to get them to see that sin was their problem so when he says you believe on me you believe on him that sent me it is impossible to believe on Christ without believing that he's the Son of God. Which is what the Pharisees had a big problem with. They thought that they, he had made himself equal with God. Well, he didn't make himself equal to God, he just was. Okay, he never claimed to be anything other than that which he was. In fact, when Pilate is questioning him, he says, are all these things true? He said, you said it. He couldn't offer a defense. Because if he did, Pilate would have been forced to let him go. He did nothing wrong. But he couldn't offer, he was silent as a lamb before the shears. If he'd opened his mouth, I mean, he said, I am in the garden. When they came to arrest him, everybody fell over. Just as the words and the power of saying who he was. So imagine what would have happened to Pilate if he just opened up his mouth and started explaining everything. Might have just melted into a pool or a puddle. I don't know. But I do know that he remained silent, not for his sake, but for our sake. He did not come to set up his reign. He came to fulfill the will of the Father. And in order to do so, he had to be obedient, even obedient unto the death of the cross. So he says, you're not believing on me, you're believing on him that sent me. Not just in what he did, but in all that he fulfilled. He came and he said, I do the will of the Father. But then there was a lot that he didn't say that he did. But like in this chapter, John says that it might be fulfilled. But those that understood what the Old Testament said, they understood in hindsight, after all this had transpired, it was brought back to their remembrance, we so often read, that they remembered when it happened and then they realized why he said what he said. Or why he did what he did. And everything that he did fulfilled not only the fullness of the law so that he was perfect in the eyes of God when it comes to sin. There was no sin in him. Wasn't even tempted. You know, though he was tempted for our sake. But really, if you're the devil, how are you going to tempt the one that has all power? Right in the garden, he wasn't being tempted with sin. The devil's trying to kill him. He was trying to make his very body give out before he got to the cross. I mean, I, it was no small thing for Jesus. He had fasted for 40 days in the flesh, in the wilderness, out in the desert. You really think that it was a struggle for him to read the word of God back to the devil and refuse him? No. 
Because if it had been a problem for him then, it'd be a problem for me now to resist the devil. The Bible says resist him and he'll flee you. Not through my own strength, but through his strength. Right? He wasn't tempted to sin. He was perfect. He overcame so that we could have faith that we could overcome through him. But he fulfilled all the law. But then also he fulfilled all the prophecy through generations of prophets that came and said, one day, there's one coming. From the place that he was born all the way to the deeds that he would do once he was here. Everything that was fulfilled was not for us. I mean, it was not for him. It was for us. So that we could say, God said it all them years ago. And when we believe on Christ, we believe, one, that the law is what God said. Can't believe in Christ without first believing you as a sinner. But then also, all the proofs that he was who he said he was. God had a list. And, you know, so many years ago, if you take one of them silver dollars for every miracle or every thing that Jesus did to prove and to fulfill the Old Testament, they said that you could take it over the state of Texas and they'd come up knee high. Cover the whole state knee high in silver dollars. Just one of the things that he did to prove who he was. Yet he did them all. But how many people today will believe something that somebody says because they did one thing that they promised to do? He did them all. God promised them so long before as proof that this just wasn't coincidence. This was a, a grand design. So to believe that he, Phil's talking about the blind man, that he, to believe that he opened the blinded eyes of one that was blind from birth was to believe that he was God. But then he gave us so many examples of him being God. It was more than just happenstance. It was more than just him saying that he was. No, God ordained it. God uh, authored it. God sanctioned it. Not just believing on the servant, believing on the sender. Okay, but then we get down to verse number 45. He says, And he that seeth me, seeth him that sent me. Now again, this isn't talking about seeing with physical eyes. The Bible says that he was of no distinction. Right? He wasn't the most handsome man that ever lived. Right? But he also wasn't the most deformed that ever lived. Right? You'd walk past him and take no note of him. How do you know that? Because so many people did. Some came looking for a king and they said, where is Jesus? And they're talking to him. He's not talking about seeing with the natural eyes. He's talking about him that seeth truly who Christ is. He sees the Father. Right? That song, I love it so much, turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. Well, to get in here and to see Jesus is to see the Father to truly glimpse Christ is to glimpse God but those that came to him and realized I'm not worthy I believe that that's the son of God those that you know would in reverence bow their head and not look that woman that pressed through the crowd just to touch the hem of his garment she could have left that day without laying an eye on him but she saw who he really was and through that sight, she saw the one that sent him. Right? To believe on him is to believe on the Father. But if you get a good glimpse of him, you're not seeing him, seeing the one that sent him. He made himself of no reputation. He made himself one that was the exact opposite of everything that he had. He had all praise, honor, glory, power. He had angels flying around the throne of, throne of God in heaven, holy, holy, holy. And he was born in a stable in a borrowed you know, manger because there was no room in the inn. Right? But yet, there were three. Well, we assume three. We don't know how many of them there were. But there was a host of guys in the east. They looked up in the sky and said, that star didn't used to be there. And then they started consulting the history 
And they said, Boys, I do believe that a king in Israel has been born. And then they went to Herod's palace. They said, Hey, where's the new king? And they said, What are you talking about? And they said, Well, we'll be back. And then eventually they weren't back because God sent them a different way. But they show up where the star was. And they've got gifts fit for a king. They never saw him, never heard him, had no idea what he'd look like, where he was going to be, because from the time that he was born in Bethlehem to the time that they get there, he's in a whole different part of the country. The star's moving, and they're tracking it. And when they get there, they come in and in reverence. They offer gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh, saying, we want to do justice to the new king. We want to do service to the one that we believe because God said it. It's just going to be. You say, well, who were these magi? No idea. Don't know if they're Jewish. Just living in the East. Don't know what, but they had a copy of what God wrote down. They believed it. And they saw the star without even seeing him. They knew who he was. So when they came, they didn't see a babe in a manger. They saw who he really was. And because of that, they saw the one that sent him. I believe them boys went out blessed that night. But those that came to him, like the Pharisees, so often questioning. They didn't see him. Most of the time we find that, you know, they're arguing within themselves how they're going to catch Jesus at a fault or ask him a question and try and trick him, get him tongue tied. They weren't seeing him, they were all inward. Well, how am I going to get those that came, like at the Sermon on the Mount? Hey, y'all sit down in the grass. I'm going to get in this boat, push out a little bit, and teach y'all for a while. Those that came listening for the wisdom of man, they went out. I mean, they were filled because the Bible says that he filled them all with food. But they went out just seeing a person in a boat. But I believe that lad with the lunch, he heard what was being taught, and he didn't see a man. He saw the Son of God. Why do you think he said, Lord, here's my basket. Take it. Right? And because of that, he didn't see, some called him rabbi, some called him master, some called him Lord, but very few called him Savior. They all realized he was intellectual, that he had authority, that he was, Nicodemus said, we know that God's with you. Uh, you missed a mark. He is God. Some saw the man, others saw the God-man. And when they saw that, they saw the Father. He was the embodiment in the fruition of all that God had done up until that point and will ever do since. Because he said it was finished. He didn't say there's another part coming. No, he fulfilled it and that's good enough for all of eternity. He was not only the embodiment of what God said he'd do, he was the embodiment of all the fullness and the blessing and the mercy of God. He was everything that we ever will and ever could need. And so much more. To believe on Him, to see Him, not as the man robed in flesh, but to see Him as the one that loved us so much, you know, for God so loved the world, He sent His only begotten Son. But because the Son so loved the world, He died on the cross. Right, we love telling I mean we just sang about the cross. Now one day I got there, not physically, but through the lens of the word of God, I saw him hanging on the tree and realized this is for me. That day I wasn't just reading a story. I wasn't reading a history book. Now that day I saw him. Then I saw God. That day I believed on him and I believed on God. Truth be told, come to find out, I didn't really know all that I was believing on. Had no idea that the Holy Ghost was going to indwell me. Had no idea all that he promised that he would do. All I knew is that I needed him. 
See, that's the lens that some people choose to look at him through. We either see him as he is, or we see him as we want to see him. The Pharisees saw him as a rival. They saw him as a heretic. They saw him as somebody that was stealing the Jews away from the temple. As a result, they hated him. Some saw him as a good man or as a teacher. I mean, the one rich young ruler comes to him. What must I do? Well, he's willing to do some things, but he wasn't willing to do all. Why? Because he didn't see him as God. It's all maybe as a prophet. Maybe he's a good man. Well, missed the mark. Didn't see him as he was. As a result, he didn't believe on him. But then he goes on to say, verse number 47 and 48, paraphrase. He says, if any man doesn't hear his words, he's not going to judge them at that point in time. He says, I'm not here to judge, I'm here to save. Then in verse number 48, he says, He that rejected me hath one that judge him. Again, he's saying, I'm not going to be the one that judges whether they were right or wrong. He says, it's the words that I have spoken. The same shall judge him in the last day. Man shall not live by bread alone. Every word that comes out of the mouth of God. Jesus spoke nothing new. He only embodied what was spoken of old. He was the Word made flesh. Why do you think in Revelation when John says that when he opened his mouth, a sharp two-edged sword came out? It's because everything that he says is in line with the Word. He not only fulfilled it, but he forevermore is the very Word of God. That which was promised, that which was said would be, He is and always will be. He always was. Why do you think the Bible says that all judgment has been committed unto Christ? Because He is the Word of God. I mean, do we need to go to John 1, starting verse number 1? In the beginning was the Word, capital W. And the Word was God, and the Word was with God. The Word was made flesh and dwelt among man. His very existence brings judgment. Because He is righteousness and it shows us what we are not. When confronted with who He is, we realize what we're not. He didn't have to condemn people. He didn't have to beat them over the head in order to get them to accept Him. Zacchaeus climbed up in a tree just to get a glimpse and when he did, he realized, I need what that guy has. The blind man that never saw him, when he went and he dipped like we taught on, when he came up, he said, long before it was when he didn't just say, well, I believe that man was the Son of God when he came up out of the water. He didn't know who he was until Jesus revealed himself to him. But he did believe him long before he ever saw him. He did have faith. He's, he said, I've heard things that you've done. And because what I've heard, I believe, even though I've never seen you, even though I don't know who you are, I just know who you said you told me you, you were. And that's what he told everybody else. And as a result, he was thrown out of the temple. Right? His faith was stronger than just going down and dunking in the water. He clung to it long after he got his sight back. That how many? I mean, look with me in verse number... 42. Nevertheless, among the chief rulers also, many believed on him, but because of the Pharisees, they did not confess him, lest they should be put out of the synagogue, for they loved the praise of men more than the praise of God. It had been one thing for him to believe and get his sight back, and then say, well, I got what I wanted. Yep, you guys are right. He wasn't who he said he was. But he didn't do that knowing what was at stake. 
He said, no, y'all are wrong. I know what he did for me. Yet there were those that were chief. Those that had authority. Rulers. They believed on him. But they didn't profess him. They didn't make known that they saw who he really was. That they got a glimpse and they realized. Jesus said, if any man see me, doesn't see me. Sees God. He says, if any man believe what I say, because I believe in the man, Jesus, that was born in Bethlehem and raised in Nazareth, wasn't believing on the son of a carpenter. No, no, no. You were believing on the one that sent him. Jesus never once appealed to his own authority or his own power. He always said, the Father sent me. And because the Father sent me, that's all the authority I need, even though he had all power. Even though he had all authority. He said, I have submitted to do the will of the Father. He could have called angels to take him off the cross, although, let's be honest, he's God. He didn't need an angel to take him off that cross. He could have said the word, and the whole earth would have been gone. They didn't need thousands of angels. He was all that he needed. But he laid down his life and took it back up again. For us. But all that being said, thought for the lesson, is what do people see when they look at you? If they saw Christ, they saw God. Not the man Jesus, although some... I mean, those that grew up around him. They said, is this not the carpenter's son? Once he began his earthly ministry, they didn't see what he was doing. They saw where he came from. I mean, even one of his own disciples, Nathaniel, can anything good come out of Nazareth? Philip said, come and see. I know it sounds crazy, but you guys see it to believe it. And what did he see when he got there? He saw that Christ was who he said he was. Because Christ said, I saw you long before he ever came and fetched you. When you were sitting underneath of the fig tree, he said, you're Christ. Jesus said, because I said that I saw you, you believed. We didn't get that moment with Jesus, but I've got the word. By faith, I believe he knew long before I ever knew that he was dealing with me and convicting me about being saved. He knew exactly where I was the whole time. But now that I am saved, the one thing that was predestinated, that those that believed on His Son would be conformed to the image of His Son. Wasn't predestinated who's going to go to heaven and who's going to go to hell. What was predestinated is those that did get in would be conformed to the image of the only begotten Son of God. Because, what, we can beat in our chest that we live a certain way? No. So that we can compare ourselves to other people and feel better about it? No. We are conformed to the image of His Son because those that see the Son see the Father. If they see me, I'm in the way. What do people see when they see you? If they see deeds, but that, He did something very nice there. Well, maybe. Do you make known why you do what you do? Everything Jesus did, he said, I do the will of the Father. Sometimes he didn't explain it at the time. I mean, a few weeks ago we talked on a woman on the well. He must needs go through Samaria. Why? Because when he got there, he told him, my meat is to do the will of the Father. I hunger after what God wants me to do. Everything he did was so that men would glorify His Father. Everything He endured in the flesh, everything that He went through in the garden, everything that He went through on the cross was so that the Father would get glory and honor. And because of His obedience, God first gave Him a name that was above every other name. But now His name in heaven, the name of all names, there's nothing higher. He has been exalted above Everything. Because of his obedience. 
But likewise, how do people, when they see us, not see us? I'm not talking about, you know, some sci-fi cloaking deal where, you know, I flip a button and then I disappear. No. I'm not talking about one of them that runs around and beats on their chest all the time. Well, I'm doing this for God. I'm doing this for God. God, watch them people. Because just like the rulers of the synagogue, the rulers of the people, some beat on their chest so that they get the recognition because they love the praise of men more than the praise of God. I'm talking about when somebody looks at your life, they see something different. Now you've got such a touch from God on you that they don't see you. They see Him. Because as the Apostle Paul wrote, Yet not I, Christ liveth in me. Paul died. Saul died. Christ was born in him. And that's what he desired to have manifest and made apparent in his life to other people. It's not me. It's him. But see, even in Jesus' day, some people didn't really see who he was. Just because you're doing your best, don't let the devil beat you up. That once you've died out to self, right? Once you've taken your cross daily with you, and every day you nail the flesh back to the cross, because that's who we wrestle against. You're doing your best to be yoked up with Him and to be pressing toward the mark of the high calling of Jesus Christ. Right? I know old Slewfoot. He's going to come in and say, well, you're doing your best, but nobody's noticing. That's not up to you. All you can do is do what the Father told you to do. There wasn't one second that Jesus was on this earth that He didn't do the will of the Father. Not since the beginning of time has the Son ever done anything that was not the will of the Father. I mean, even when God put all the iniquity of mankind from the beginning of earth... It pleased him to bruise him. It was the will of God for that to happen, even though God had to break fellowship with his only begotten son. Why? So that, through his death, many would be born. Right? I mean, even in this chapter, it talks about the seed. The plant has to die, the seed has to go in the ground so that it can bring forth fruit. He was the true vine. The devil thought that he plucked the vine out, but it came back, and there wasn't anything he could do. Couldn't prune it, can't stop it. The gates of hell shall not prevail against the church of the living God. But just because you're doing the best that you can, and by the grace of God, you don't rely on the arm of flesh, but you rely upon the strength and the might of Jesus to help you and accomplish what you cannot accomplish just because you're doing the devil's going to creep up but how many people have taken note of what you're doing for God not my problem Jesus did the will of God every second of every day yet there were those that came to him and they left disappointed because they didn't see him as he was how many Pharisees that claim to be experts on the law of God and the word of God how many came to him and left not realizing not seeing who he was just because somebody doesn't see Christ in you today is not reason to stop letting Christ live in you tomorrow just because somebody may misunderstand maybe God's still working on them you're just planting and you're watering all I can do is what God instructs me to do and do it to the best of my ability and then have faith that He'll do the rest. I wonder how many people throughout Jesus' earthly ministry I wonder how many of them left one day but then came back another day to see something else and see something else. How many of us got saved the first time we heard the gospel? How many of us got saved the first time we felt conviction? They may not have seen Him as Lord 
the first day, but maybe they did on the second. Maybe they did on the third. But Christ was constant. He always did the will of the Father. He did things that didn't make sense to man. Sometimes his disciples, Lord, why are we doing this? Lord, what's going on? Lord, the ship's sinking. Can you wake up? Lord, if it be you, bid me come out on the water. So many times they're wondering, why in the world is this happening? Only for him to be doing the perfect will of God. You know, I'm sure it confused them when they said, I mean, beginning of this chapter, he's sitting there eating dinner with Lazarus in Bethany. Well, he's dead. I'm sure it didn't make sense to them when they got the news that Lazarus was sick unto death and he stayed there for two more days. Then he tells them that his sickness was for the glory of God. I'm sure that they didn't understand it. I'm sure when they heard that Lazarus was dead, that they were disheartened. Some of them probably even mourned. Jesus is even touched with the heartbrokenness of those that were at Bethany because one of the saddest but also one of the sweetest verses in the Bible, Jesus wept. He cared enough about their brokenheartedness that He wept. But also, God Himself wept. I mean, that's a, a tough verse. But I mean, I wonder how many times He's wept when he saw the state that I was in, that I was born into, that I was conceived into. You can go up to somebody and say, hey, do you know that Jesus cried? It's another thing for him to realize that Jesus may have cried for them. He was made broken so that we could be made whole. But then again, imagine how much it breaks his heart when he looks at the nail prints that hole in his side left by that spear and he sees those that don't live according to the will of the Father he says this is how much I loved you yet you don't love me the same if we're doing everything every day all I need is the, will, er, the approval of God I don't care what people think I don't care what results if it's the will of God, it's right to do. Because, again, look at verse number 43. For they love the praise of men more than the praise of God. All I need is a pat on the back. Well done, boy, from God, and I'm good. I can sleep easy at night. I can face whatever comes my way tomorrow. Because I don't just know the one that holds my hand. He's got his seal of approval on what I did. Some may not see it today, but just keep going. Maybe it's because of your endurance. Maybe it's because of your faithfulness that they'll take note. Maybe it's because of when it's the hardest in your life, yet you continue to do what God has purposed in your heart to do. Maybe it's then that they'll see a diamond in the rough. And guess what? We're the rough. He's the diamond. Maybe life, and we think, Lord, why am I going through this? Maybe God has to strip away some of the clay so that they can see that treasure that He's hidden in earthen vessels. Maybe trials are not for me to get stronger, it's for me to get weaker so that He can become bigger. His strength is made perfect in weakness. If I've got to get broken for Him to show out, are we willing to endure it? Are we willing to embrace pain so that others can receive life? If it's heartbrokenness, if it's physical pain, emotional pain, spiritual warfare, are we willing to receive it and say, Lord, thy will be done? Because I read that that's what he did. I mean, Spurgeon, I don't know if he was right. But a great analogy, he said that just for Jesus to walk in this world, being holy and being righteous, just walking in a sin-cursed world would be like us walking through a briar patch naked. 
pricked at him all the time. That's nothing compared to the agony that he endured and suffered on the cross. But even long before he went to the cross, it pained him to be in this world because this world was the exact op It was the enemy of what he was. It was sin. It was cursed with sin. It had been corrupted by sin. Can you imagine the pain that may have come to his ears when he heard one that was talking with a sin-cursed tongue talk to him? I don't know what that would have sounded like. But I know that he endured it. And he responded. And he received those that came to him. He is the friend of publicans and sinners. So what if it offends me that somebody does something? I'll suffer the indignation in the flesh if that's what it takes for God to get the glory. Do people see somebody that can endure for a time, but then get fed up? I never found where Jesus got fed up. I saw where he was filled with righteous indignation after he made a three-quartered whip. But what was that? That was for the Father's honor. He was driving the wickedness out of the Father's house. He came to save. He came to point people to God. And they had a building not pointing people to God. They had a people or a building pointing people to buy your sacrifices here. Here's the easy way out. There was no easy way out with God. It cost God everything. There is no easy way to endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. There are no cheat codes. There are no shortcuts. Every now and then, you just got to put your nose to the grind and let a few of, you know, a little bit of your nose get taken off. Because you're enduring. But He promised that He'd be there with us every step of the way. You can do anything if you've got hope. Some of the greatest acts of heroism throughout war, some of the greatest, you know, accounts of sacrifice and love from parents or from, you know, maybe it was a plane crash or something. Some of the greatest things that people look back and say, wow, that was special. They did it because they had hope. Doesn't matter what happens to me as long as they can get through it. As long as they get what they need. As long as they have what I believe they need, it'll be worth it. Why don't we have that mentality when it comes to people that are lost? Say what you want to about me. I don't care. I know that I'm going to be judged one day and it's by every word that's in this book. I'd rather do what he told me to do. I don't care what you think about me. Well, I may have gotten beat up today while well, I'm in good company. They beat Jesus up. I've still got my beard. Jesus didn't by the time he, he you know, they got done with him. I've still got all the skin on the brow of my head he didn't after they platted that crown of thorns on his head. I'm still able to walk without somebody else being instructed to take my cross. Right? I don't believe that Jesus gave it to him, But they told him to help carry it. He said, nope, I got this. You know why they told somebody else to help him? Because his visage was marred much more than a man. They said he's just a pile of bones. How's he even still carrying that thing? There's no way he's going to make it up these two miles down the Via Della Rosa. No way he'll make it all the way to Calvary. He did. But what if in my life it has to be, there's no way he's going to make it. Well, you're right. I'm not going to make it, but he can carry me to it. If I've got to get to such a point that all people see are bones and muscles and ligaments, they don't see who they remember me being. They see something that's been beaten up, chewed out. Well, that may be what you see, but I've got the stamp of approval from God. If that's what it takes for them to see who's inside of me, Lord, strip it all away. Take it all, because you bought it all. My life's no longer my own. But when they came and they saw Jesus, they saw God. Well, if somebody came and took a good, you know, good hard look at your life, put you under a microscope, would they see God? 
Would they see man? Would they see sounding brass and tinkling cymbals? Would they see somebody that did for their own honor and their own glory? Or would they see the darling, beloved Son of God? If you enjoyed today's message, head on over to ibcforums.com and click on sermons. And don't forget to check out our other links in the notes section of today's broadcast. As always, thanks for listening.